Hello, James Berryman here with my persuasive speech, and these are my audience members. My grandfather is perhaps the strongest person I have ever known. And I say this without exaggeration. He wasn't necessarily a huge guy, but he just had this unbelievable brute strength. I like to tell this story about how when I was a teenager, we were actually working on my first car, the beloved 1980 Chevy Chevette. And uh, I was working with my grandfather and my dad. And we were having a tough time driving up onto these racks in order to do some work on it. Well, my grandfather has my dad and I stand on either side of the front end of the car. And the guy reaches down, grabs the bumper, and lifts the front end of the car. Now, in all fairness, the engine wasn't in it at that time, but still, my dad and I are looking at him, dumbfounded, and he's, you know, he's holding this car and going, oh, I can't hold this all day. Ultimately, of course, we put them under, under there. He just blew me away. And this, to me, was what he was, strong as an ox. He actually, to me, embodied that whole concept. Um, incidentally, a few years after that had happened, uh, he died. And I was, I was very close to them. I was very angry about that. I was frustrated. How is it possible that a guy as strong as he was could die? And he died at a young age, in my opinion. He was 68 years old and he had a heart attack. And that was about 20 years ago, and it still bothers me. A few years ago, I ran into a similar situation. It's my dad. He had a heart attack and before the age of 60. And he made it. He's still alive, thankfully. But he hasn't really been the same since. And that gave me a big wake-up call, too. Um, I'm, I'm 37. We'll be 37. And so now I'm going, wait a minute. Is this me? Is this my fate? Is this what I'm going to have to deal with? I'll tell you right now, I have a lot of stuff that I want to do with my life. And dying at 58 of a heart attack is not on that list. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. If you have a, a, a history of heart, heart disease in your family, this speech is for you. If you have a loved one that has a history of heart disease or even diabetes or stroke in their family, this speech is for you. And if you're an allied health major like most of us are, this speech is for you. And the biggest concept here is that it is our diet that is killing us. And it's our diet that has to change. A few facts for you. 2006, in the Journal of American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, heart disease was to cost us in excess of $250 billion. Megan Stitcher wrote that in 2006. Fact, International Journal of Pharmacology, PR Rack wrote, despite medical advances, heart attacks due to coronary artery disease and stroke are responsible for more deaths than all other causes combined. In fact, New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. J. Olshansky predicts that after a trend of increases in overall lifespan over the last thousand years, we may actually see in our lifetime a decrease in lifespan. How is this possible? I mean, really? In this day and age, with the medical advances we have, it doesn't make sense. Well, part of the problem is that there's all this communication and miscommunication, or confusion and miscommunications about the fact that we're dealing with treating problems based on their symptoms rather than the root cause. And the root cause, it's our diet that's killing us. And it's our diet that we have to change. So, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, James. We don't all have the same diet. In the United States, we have a broad array of different people from different cultures and different backgrounds. Well, there have been studies that have been done recently that have kind of shown at least a few commonalities, okay? So, one of these, James Ubari, who's a nephrologist, in seminars of dialysis in 2003, he writes about how he was looking to find out why there was so much more prevalence of phosphorus in his patients. Where was phosphorus? 7-Eleven. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, Chris Wollstrom, when he wrote in 2001, what's wrong with the American diet? The issue was the prevalence of convenience foods. Right now, as it stands, there are over 170,000 fast food restaurants, hundreds of thousands of convenience stores, and oh yes, <laughs> millions of vending machines filled with empty calories. What that does is essentially, it means we have a lot more calories, but we're actually intaking less nutrients. And that takes us to the second thing. 
Grandma told you to eat your vegetables, didn't she? That's kind of trite. But this is what's really happening. In her, in her article in the New York Times in 1991, Marianne Burroughs wrote that basically vegetables are being pushed off the plate in favor of convenience foods. And the article was called, incidentally, Rethinking the Four Food Groups. Well, this takes us to another thing which is a key, key indicator. And it's really kind of the culmination of, of this entire talk. And that is, there have been a number of studies done recently by T. Colin Campbell, Dean Ornish, John McDougall, Caldwell Esselstyn, name a few. And what they have discovered is that one of the biggest problems that we have is protein. Now the thing is, and this is kind of a bitter pill for a lot of people to swallow, it's animal protein that's killing us as well. Now, the thing is, when you're looking at these studies, these are not little studies. These are extremely well done, and especially if you're allied health majors, you'll, you'll really appreciate how the scientific method that's in these, because we have references after references after references. And the China study, it, it, it touts itself as the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever conducted. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, one of the most just unbelievably well done studies. If you ever read it, it's, it's an outstanding chance to really see some good scientific work. But, okay, if that's the case, why are we not told this? Well, because unfortunately, and I love this quote, this, is really, this encapsulates it better than I can even say it. Esselstyn says, we are immersed in an environment of toxic food that is attractive, tasteful, reasonably priced, and heavily advertised. And there are powerful commercial interests that want no change in the American diet. We're not being told because a lot of very wealthy people don't want us to know. The alternative, eat your vegetables. It really is not, and of course here, I'm not going to tell you to, to switch to a plant-based diet overnight because that's a big overhaul. I mean, in a 10-minute speech, you really think that I'm going to make that kind of a powerful impact? Maybe, but not likely. But I am going to ask you to at least consider a few things. There are a lot of people that are now moving to a plant-based diet. And a lot of these people are not just kind of like the off to the side folks too. These are now mainstream popular popular folks. Brendan Brazier is a world uh, world champion triathlete as well as ultra marathoner. And actually this guy here is, is Dave Scott, six time world championship triathlete. Um, this is uh, Carl Lewis, Olympic sprinter. And yes, Mike Tyson was even on a plant based diet for quite some time. Obviously you can get enough protein there. And you may have even seen Bill Clinton here over the last year on CNN and David Letterman talking about how he had moved to a plant-based diet because he doesn't want to do another bypass. So what do you do with this information? Well, here's what I would ask. Do your own homework. Okay, I'm not asking you to read books and books. I already told you that there's a lot of misinformation. A great starting place is Forks Over Knives. Great film. You can watch it in an hour, hour and a half. And it'll point you in a lot of good directions. Another film, by the way, I highly endorse is Food, Inc. It's very well done. This year, when you go to do your uh, New Year's resolutions, consider leaving meat off your plate once a week, or even once a month. You're eventually going to have to do it anyway, unless you want to bypass. So you might as well at least get used to it early on. And finally, if you do nothing else, tell somebody about this. I'll put my speech on way. Show people. Let them know. There are alternatives that are a lot less invasive than having your chest ripped open. This is my motivation for this, too. See, the thing is, I want to be alive. I have a lot of stuff that I want to do. And essentially, come on up here. Stop. You can stop your car. You can stop your car. Please, um, this is my motivation. My family. This is my other visual aid. <laughs> So, I gotta tell you this, giving up a few cheeseburgers is pretty easy because nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. Nothing. Thank you. You have chocolate? I don't want to go after that. I want to say please stop it. Oh. Good job. Aww. Stop. Here? Yep.